Hello, uh, my name is Shona Ulrikson. I'm a, a board member at Oscar, and it's my pleasure to be cheering the event today. And so I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, which is um, going to hand over to Maury, who's going to tell you all about Oscar, and will include some key updates for charity trustees. I had my driving glasses on so I could see you all, and can I just say, you should be fine for filming, you're all looking pretty good from up here. You're looking a bit hazy now, but that's fine, I can see my, see my notes and that's the main thing. So, let me tell you a little bit about Oscar, and um, just to take you, take you through some information. I'm not going to tell you all about us, but just some, just some little bits. So, that's what we're going to be covering today, in terms of the overall agenda. So... Oscar, most of you know a fair amount about us, I guess, and that's why you're here, um, or you're here because you know a little bit more, a little bit about us, and you want to know a lot more. So let's just give you some genetic information. We're 16 years old. We're a non-ministerial office. That's quite an important thing about who we are in terms of how we sit aside from government. So all the staff are civil servants, um, but we, are not, we don't directly report to any minister. We report directly to Parliament, and it's quite an important distinction about us. It means that we, we have that at-distance relationship with them so that we can talk to them more actively right across government about policy and any concerns that we have and so on. So that gives us the space to do that. We have about 50 staff, um, and we're all based in Dundee. Um, I only joined the organisation at the end of January. Um, as, as Shona was saying, I'm, I'm there as the, as the interim um, chief executive, and those of you who keep an eye on, on jobs will know that the, job is actually, the permanent job is actually advertised at the moment. So if you know of anybody that's um, really itching to, to be in an incredible job, leading an incredible organisation and um, supporting the charity sector, then tell them to have a look. Um, the staff there are a range of specialists and support staff, um, and I have to say that having been there now for seven or eight months, I'm absolutely bowled over by the commitment in, in, in the whole staff team. People stay in Oscar because they love Oscar. So it's a really nice place to be. I walk along back and forth in the, in, in, in the office and I hear people talking, possibly to some of you, um, and they know their stuff. They, they have a huge amount of knowledge and depth and they really care. That their job and our whole job in the organisation is to support the sector. It's not to sit, and I think some people think, oh, if you're a regulator, your job is to try and trip people up and, uh, and see if you can ask them smart aleck questions and then catch them out. Uh, anything but, and I hear staff ha handling very complex um, areas indeed in a very good way. So I would say to you, if you haven't had much contact with us, if you ever feel the need, please do get in touch. We're a very friendly bunch, and um, hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to some people today. Oscar's vision. To build charities you can trust that provide public benefit. We're um, what's, what we call an enabling regulator. And I think that's, that says quite a lot. That's about us making sure that we're not just being very functional in our regulatory duties. We're there to support, to challenge, to engage, to develop. So really we spend a lot of our time trying to be as empowering as we can and enabling as we can to the charity sector. So that, I think, takes us into um, territory with quite a lot of other regulators, but not all. So some, some regulators that you'll engage with will be much more functional in terms of the practicalities that they will cover. Um, we're, we're, we're there to, to, to lend a hand as well as to, as, as to do the, the, the rest of the breadth of our work. We work without fear or favour. As, as I say, we have that, that independence that enables us to do that. And we support charities, staff and trustees on their continuous journey um, to improvement and also hold them to account. Um, so when we do that, again, um, we, we will do that very co confidently and comfortably. So if you're ever concerned about, about your own charity or, 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 or an, um, another charity that you come across, please give us a call. We're not going to just say, ha-ha, now that we've got something there, we're going to go and see what, what bad things we can do to people, anything but. Our year in numbers is quite a useful thing to think about. Um, the numbers actually stay relatively stable um, for, 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 for the most part, but it's quite nice to have a look at, 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 at some of these. 
Um, of course, the, the, the number that are, jo that are joining us, 65% joining us who are SKIOs. Um, if you know what SKIOs are, that's good. If you don't, then ask one of us um, at, at, at the break. In fact, ask Martin at the break or Jude at the break. They'd love that. And if, when Neil comes back in, he would particularly love to talk to you about SKIOs. It's one of his favourite things. But, you know, when we were set up 16 years ago, nobody was thinking that this was going to be the scale that it is. So very many organisations now want to come in and, 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 and join us as SKIOs. Um, one of the numbers that we're particularly proud of is the, the, the level of views of annual reports and accounts on the register. That'll be for a whole variety of reasons. It'll be funders, all sorts of different people who are just curious and interested about, interested about where their money's going. But all in all, we, we like the idea that since you have to send us lots of information and you have to send us your accounts and, 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 and reports, I think it's quite reassuring that actually people are bothering to stop and read them. So it's not like it's coming to us and nobody's doing anything with them. We are, and then other people are looking. So who do we regulate? It's quite good to look at this in a whole different set of ways. And when we discuss this with our board and within the organisation, we talk about it in scale, looking at um, the, 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 the amount of charities per head of population. We look at where they are geographically. We do all sorts of things. But looking at this financial one is a really interesting one. It's just one snapshot. But what it tells you is that um, you know, the, the, the vast majority of, of charities relatively small. So if you look at that 10 million plus, there's only 1% in there. Anybody in here in that 1%? No. Excellent. Yay, we do have one. You are the 1%. Congratulations. In fact, that, that works out pretty nicely in the numbers. So thank you for being here. Um, when you look at the rest of the, the, the numbers, what it, what it basically tells you is the, the vast majority of people are sitting with relatively small amounts of money. That's not the only part that's important to us because in, in terms of scale, you might, you might have many organisations small in financial terms, but that doesn't mean that they're small in terms of the impact that they have, the reach they have. And, and, and so on. So that's not the only thing we take into account. There have been discussions every now and again of do we not bother with organisations if they've just got a really small amount of money and that's just not the case for us at the moment. So everyone, no matter what size, very important to us. Here's some of what we do. We register new charities. And again, what's interesting there is the number of charities that, that we have on our books tends to be relatively stable. So although we spend quite a lot of time registering new charities, we also spend quite a lot of time helping charities to, to, to wind down. So there's, there's a, there seems to be a strange balance to in and out, um, just this, this, this amazing percentage of, of, of people in, our, in, in Scotland who want to have, want to have charitable status. We help to shape policy. I think it's a really important part of what we do that we gather and know a huge amount about the charity sector in Scotland. With 24 and a half, almost 25,000 charities on our books, the amount of engagement that we do, the amount of interaction we have, the amount of data, the amount of analysis we have, we sit with an enormous amount of intelligence and we spend a lot of our time working with other parts of Scottish Government and with government colleagues to try and make sure that if they're developing policy that we're in there as early as we possibly can be to make sure that they know and understand what the charitable sector is doing within that sphere. So although everybody would normally think, well, you probably just deal with those who deal with charities. Well, actually, almost every part of government, whether it's Scottish Government or UK for that matter, Charities have such a broad reach and impact everywhere, so whether it's health, environment, education, whatever, we try and make sure that the, the intelligence we have is being used to have that sphere of influence, and it's something that we're increasingly focusing on. Oh, disappeared that one. I was told to, to keep an eye on the down button, but I forgot about that there. Let's bring that back. Helping charities understand and comply with their duties it's not easy being a, a, a trustee, and I imagine almost all of you um, don't need me to tell you that. Um, people get involved in it because they think, this is a great organisation, I really believe in this. And then they get there and think, wow, for most of us, it's complicated. And it's, it, it's increasingly complex in terms of things you have to do. 
it's our, one of our roles to work with many organisations, but we have a specific and discrete role in terms of making sure that we bring out guidance to support and to, to, to support trustees and to support those running charities to, to, to really understand their duties. Um, we don't want to be, have people trip, uh, tripped up. And I think what's interesting is when people get things wrong, for the most part, most people don't set out to get something wrong. It's unintentional when things, when, when, when things go wrong. So what we try and do is understand what are we hearing about in terms of concerns or complaints and so on. And that really ta that, that takes us into the space where we'll think, well, we better write some guidance about that or we better get involved with two or three other organisations to go out and deliver some training or awareness raising on that. Because... If we're doing our job really well, we'll get less and less complaints and concerns because everybody will know what they're doing and do it, do it the best they possibly can. We are absolutely here to take action when a charity breaks the rules. Um, if you go onto our website um, reasonably regularly, you'll see updates on, on, on inquiries. We publish our, our reports when we undertake an inquiry. And we take it very seriously when we hear that, 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 that an, an organisation or an individual is doing something inappropriate. And within, within our team, we, 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 have, uh, we have legal specialists. We also have um, our, our, our own solicitors that we'll go to for specific legal advice and we'll take things through and um, whatever due process we, we require to do. So I suppose what I'm saying to you is, although we do all of the positive and empowering area as well, please be very clear that when we do hear about something inappropriate, we do, we, we, we do take action because that's what helps people to keep, feel confident in charities. If we get that right, the public feel more confident in charities, therefore we'll give more money, we'll give more of their time and we'll be more engaged. So if people know that the regulator's doing that, then I think that increases public confidence. One of the areas that we've been really talking about a lot this year, and some of you may have seen quite a lot of uh, media interest in our notifiable events, that's about charities telling us when things happen. It's really, really important that if something goes, goes, goes wrong in, your, in, in the charity that you're involved in, and you're thinking mm, this is something significant, please get in touch. It's not, it's not an admission of failure to get in touch with us if something's gone wrong. If you've spotted something, you're trying to work through it and you're, you're really trying to mitigate what's going on there. You're thinking, okay, we found out that, 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 that somebody wasn't doing the right thing or we were doing the wrong thing in that way. Phone us and talk to us and tell us about that. It's a really interesting area um, for, for, for me and very reassuring for me that more and more people do that. We've had 320 notifiable events in three years. I think that's a real success. But interestingly, when we were looking at, at that in the media, media were saying, oh, that's 320 people who were doing really bad things. How do you feel about that? Isn't that awful? And you think, wow, have you never made a mistake in your life? So people making mistakes is going to happen. It's very important to pick up the phone and let us know. We'll work that through and, 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 and try to understand exactly what's going on. Um, they, they, and, and then we'll handle that whichever way we need to handle that. There's lots of different things that people, fo that people get in touch with us on, but financial loss is the most reported um, with um, almost a quarter there, as you can see. We talk increasingly in the organisation about undertaking our work um, as targeted regulation. So I want to just really focus in a little bit on what that means. With, uh, with, with almost 25,000 charities, what we're not trying to do is to, is to go out and look at everybody's information in the same way all of the time. So there are particular things, particular areas, particular thematics that we, we look at and we drill into that, that bit deeper. We look very closely at anything that, that's giving us a concern that there might be deliberate mismanagement of charities and anything that's coming in on that is taken up high on our risk register. We have a risk framework and, 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 and an approach to risk where we, get, we, 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 will, we, we will really kind of code things. So sometimes if you're, if you're thinking, wow, I mentioned something to you and, and, and I haven't heard anything back, 
we will have had a look and done a risk assessment. And if we're thinking that that's actually a relatively low risk, then we may deprioritise it for a while while we actually work through the rest of our priority. It's a, tri a triage system, and, and I think hopefully you would expect us to do that. We don't just think, well, we got that one in the 1st of August, so it doesn't, look how, it doesn't matter how scary that one is that came in on the 10th. We'll get to that in due course. We try to constantly prioritise. Obviously, there also is criminal activity. Charity trustees' lack of knowledge, and we mentioned that earlier on, there is that duty um, on trustees to know what they need to know. It's not good enough to say, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that's really what I was coming in to do. So um, it is something we take very seriously um, if, if we're hearing that, that something's going wrong in a charity but the, and the trustees appear not to know what they're, what, 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 what they're supposed to be doing and what their, their remit and duties are. Attempts to gain charitable status for private benefit. Um, again, that, that's something that is, as that comes through, as anybody's getting in touch to, to, to set up a new charity or to change the, 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 the um, purposes of their charity, this is something that we're very alert to. And a lack of clarity of the charity brand, if it's really difficult to work out what on earth your, your charity is trying to do. Um, and and, and some, some people are very complex, so it's not about it, we keep, keeping it as easy as possible. But if it's not clear what, what the charity is trying to do, then that would be, that, be something that we would, we, we would be concerned about and look at further. And obviously charities, charities that don't provide public benefit. Um, and there are easy examples of that to think of when, when people talk about um, particularly um, old, old, old beautiful buildings being, 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 being taken into, in, 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 into an organisation, but nobody's ever going to get to use them, nobody's ever going to get to go in and see them, nobody is going to get to do anything with them apart from a few people, then that's something that we would want to think, really? What's that about? So anything that's not about the, the, the automatic um, and, and sort of public benefit is something that we would explore. I've mentioned public quite a lot in this and we are spending a lot more of our time um, this year and we will be in the next couple of years on really focusing in on public trust it's a complicated one for, 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 for us in the, and we have our discussions and debates and considerations all the time. Do people need to know who Oscar are out, out there? Does it, do I need to, to, to get to the stage where I worked for HMI um, as an education inspector till, and, and for quite a few years? Do I need to get to the stage that HMI was a well-known brand because most people know about it because of schools? Do we need Oscar to be as well known as that? Or what do we need to do to make sure that people know that there's a regulator there and it helps to build public trust? But here are some of the main areas that, that we need to think about was public trust and charities. So the vast majority of people are saying that trust is important when they're donating. They need to know that they, they, they can have absolute faith, obviously, that any money they're putting in is going to be spent where they, where they think it's going to be. And high levels are saying charity regulation is important. Knowing how much goes to the, the, co the cause increases trust. And that's the, the, the area that we're all increasingly used to, where you, you, it's very nice to be able to talk in percentage terms to people about, you know, over 75% goes straight to X or 90% goes straight to X. And it helps people to think, oh, that's fine. They know what they're doing. And evidence of achievements. It's a funny thing for, for, for people in, in Scotland. This is one of these sweeping statements of we're very shy about, uh, about what we do. We all, we're all kind of prone to saying, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm OK. Most people here don't say, I'm fantastic at that. I'm great at that. And I think it's really, really important to be doing that for, for, with, with your charity. Make sure that people do know what you've done and what you've delivered and with, 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 within your own report. And there's real, there's, there are great opportunities within your, within your reports to really shout from the, the rooftops about what you do. So here's some things that we think we can do to improve trust. We get our guidance right. We engage as soon as possible with problems and issues, which is why we triage. Be strong when we have to. Um, it's all very nice being an empowering regulator, but if people were starting to think, yeah, they're too soft, they don't ever actually really work hard on, 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 on things when tough things happen, that wouldn't be helpful. 
let the public know we're here and make the register as good a tool as possible for transparency. And that's something that we, we, we're, we're working on and working with government colleagues to consider. Things charities can do to improve trust. We would say this, wouldn't we? But it is really helpful to get your reports and returns to us on time. If people can go to them where, and, and, and find them when they expect to find them, that gives them a confidence that you're being well run as, a, as, a, as an organisation. Make sure your registry, uh, register entry is up to date. These things can seem small and pedantic, but again, it's things that, that if they're not there, they can give people wobbles, give people concerns. So anything we can do on this is really helpful. Shout about how you make a difference. Um, maybe we're not as shy about organisations as we are about ourselves. I see some great information coming out about charities, so I think it's, it's, it's find, find, find the great work that you see and either replicate it or do even better than it. Invest in your governance. It's so important to invest in yourselves. I think what's interesting is, like many organisations, um, I think um, people, find, people find it difficult to think that they should prioritise themselves and spend money on looking after themselves, training themselves, thinking about that governance. It's really important to do regular health checks within, within your governance, and there'll be more of that later. And here's a small plug. Use your free registration logo. So, we have these registration logos that, we, that, 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 that every charity can download. A um, bit of a straw poll, do most people here, do, does anybody know if they, do they use it? Do you use the, 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 the download? Reasonable yeah. amount? Yeah. yeah? But some people know. No. So, if we look at what the benefits are. So, having, a, having something there that has your particular charity number on it that says we regulate you as soon as people th see that they should be thinking Phew, well that's okay somebody is watching over them that's pretty good we'll 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 trust them we'll trust them with our money our time our resources our children our our, 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 our parents all sort and everybody else in between so it really does help what we've been doing um, over the over the last while is making sure that the offer on the regist the registration logo is, is is even better i think um you know my right in thinking 30,000 around about 30,000 downloads so far so lots of people using it which is great but what we were hearing back from people is Actually, it was in a very specific format, and sometimes the format didn't fit with if you had a particular flyer or a, 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 a different kind of publication, it didn't fit to that. So we brought it out in a few different colours, a couple of different shapes, so that that should really help to address that. So if you've had problems downloading it in the past and you want to try it out again, please do. And um, We think it's a really good way to build public trust. Most of you will be aware that there was a charity law consultation in, 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 in the earlier part of the year that was happening. I think it closed in March, was it, Jude? Something around then? End of March, early April, something around then. Um, it was all happening just as I came into the organisation, which was very handy if you needed to do homework for what was going on in the charity sector for a job. So um, that suited me quite nicely to be coming into that world at that point. Um, the analysis has now been published. What I want to do is just highlight some of the main themes that, that, um, that, that was looked at. Really high levels of engagement in the consultation with 308 um, organisations and individuals actually engaging within it. So lots of people taking it very seriously and an overwhelming response in terms of people saying, yes, the powers that were, were talked about in it made a lot more sense. So overwhelmingly positive feedback from, from those that, that participated. And we're working very closely with Scottish Government colleagues to consider how to move forward on some of the, the, the areas that have come through on it. Um, I think a lot of us had high hopes that there would be new legislation happening very quickly on the, on, 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 on the back of the consultation. That's not going to be the case because, um, as, as I'm sure I don't need to tell, tell you all, um, we live in very complicated and um, busy um, legislative times at the moment. Um, so we're certainly hoping that we're working towards later in, the year, uh, later in, in, in this session, beginning of the next, where um, the, the, the idea is that 
the Scottish Government really do have a strong commitment to the charity sector and want to get the, the, the legislation right. So we want to use everything we already know about the, about the sector to help to improve that legislation. So what have we got that's new? We've got some new guidance on the Oscar website. We've got some on charity accounting, thinking of becoming a charity, and investment guidance. The other thing that we've been doing is we have a beta version of our trustee guidance out there just now. Um, it can be quite complicated coming onto the Oscar website to try and find the guidance that you actually need. Um, it's, it's, that, that, it's that question of, I don't know what I don't know, so how do I work out what I do actually need? So um, Ian and, and Jude and, and, and other colleagues with, 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 within our engagement and communications area have been working on a tailored set of guidance so that you can basically go onto the website, pop in some details about yourself, and that will actually then bring out a tailored set of guidance for you or for your individual organisation. So again, if you haven't looked at that or, 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 or done that sort of thing for a while, have a look at the beta. Um, and it is a beta version just now because we know we're testing it and we want to get it right. So if you do it and try it out and you've got anything to say on it, please, please get back to us. Anything you can do to help us improve it would be really, really appreciated. What else is new? Our online application form. What we've done is actually move our, our, our application form online. Sounds very, it sounds like a nice, easy, straightforward thing. It took a lot of heartache and, and for, for Martin and a number of his colleagues. So any time I see it, I want to be close enough just to pat his arm to say it's okay now it's out there. Um, it's going really well. We're getting really strong feedback from it. People are actually really um, finding it much easier to, 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 to use um, with, with the way that it's accessible. It asks the right questions to take you through. So again, if you talk to to people who need to, 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 to engage with us and apply, you don't have to say to them, gosh, it was really terrible when we had to do it, it was really traumatic, or you could say that and then say, but it's different for you, so you're lucky because there's a much better process in place. So um, th that, that, that's certainly one of our new areas. One area that's coming is our new digital strategy. It's, um, it's something that um, we, we, we looked at and thought, We've always been updating and refreshing what we, what we do digitally. Our website is con constantly improving everything that we do to engage um, and, uh, with, with, um, with, with charities on a digital framework is changing. But we, what we want to do is to actually get more of our services available online. I know not everybody likes to be online. Sean and I were just talking earlier on about we've got a board meeting on tomorrow and, and um, we, we, we send out all of our board papers online. And then we, we say to some, but do you really still want them on my paper? And people say, yeah, we really still want them on my paper. So some people love online, some people don't. But we know that it's cheaper, it's accessible. And most people, if they don't have their own facility, can certainly access something in, in, in their own area. So we do want to make sure that the vast majority of things are available online. We've got an, an advanced suite of online guidance coming um, and more efficient ways to try and, and, and connect and contact with others. We've been doing a lot on, on, on social channels as well. We've been doing a lot of engagement through, um, through Twitter, um, through Facebook, through lots of uh, as many different social, uh, social media channels as we can. We want to make sure that we are engaging, we're, we're getting the word out there. It was interesting when I first came to the organisation that people said, oh, Oscar, in some ways, do you, 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 uh, you try and keep yourselves a little bit below the radar? We were all smiling and saying, well, no, that's not what we're for. We know that people need to know who we are and what we do. So so the more that we promote ourselves, it's not a selfish thing to promote ourselves. We think the more that people know about us, the more that they will trust um, us, the more they will trust you, and the more that they'll understand about the breadth of the charity sector. So that is another big, 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 big area for us. And in fact, our new digital strategy is on, is, is on said board papers and going to the, go, going to the board tomorrow for, for discussion and consideration. We've also uh, got work under, un, underway to update our inquiry policy. Again, it's a really important thing that we do that. One of the most disappointing things for us is the, the level of complaints we get um, about people um, being really upset about getting in touch with us about something, something we can't do something about. 
Now, that sounds a bit convoluted, but what that means, we need to be clearer about, people, about, about what we are for and not for. We need to make sure that people know what we can do and what we can't do, what we can act on and can't. Um, so what we're really trying to do with our updated inquiry policy is to make sure that people really do have a very good understanding of how we deal with concerns and so that it, it, it is to be as transparent as we possibly can. This is the first update for, for five years. Um, we think it's been working reasonably well, but we did start to see a slight increase in complaints coming through, and we know that actually, as I say, a lot of that is down to people um, thinking, but why haven't you come back to me about that? Well, because actually that's not our process. So we need to work out how to, how to get those processes as, as, as clearly understood as we possibly can and to give clarity for those who are raising concerns. There's nothing worse than putting your hand up and saying I'm concerned about something or someone out there and then thinking that we're not doing anything about it. That's the last thing in the world we want, so we need to make sure that people really do understand exactly what we do. Have we got a particular time frame on when we think we'll be uh, have our updated inquiry policy? I think we're now looking at uh, the end of the financial year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't want to just say I think it's because you know, there's an awful lot of work to be done on that and to engage with colleagues on that. So it's something that we're undertaking and we definitely will have it done um, w w w within this business year. All of that can sound like we do an awful lot of this, this work in isolation, and we absolutely don't. We love working with our colleagues um, across, the, across the sector in partnership. We want to make sure that we're all doing the right things. And In fact, I've been um, spending quite a lot of time with um, the chief exec of, of, of SEVO, the, uh, the chief executive of ACOSVO with Volunteer Scotland, to try and work out how we make sure that people know who to come to for particular things. There's nothing worse than trying to think, oh, well, I'll, I'll, which, which one of these many organisations do I go to? So I think they're fairly discreet. We think that we've, got a, we've all got a fairly discreet, clear offer. But there is plenty of, 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 of advice and support out there for, 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 for you, no matter what your query and area is. Um, and um, as I say, do please pick up a phone to us if you've got anything you want to talk to us about. Keeping in touch, that's all of our different uh, approaches of how you, how you get in touch with us these days. And I'm going to stop, take a breath and see if you've got any particular questions that, um, that, 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 that I or my colleagues can help with. Okay. Microphones never work for me. Is this microphone working for me? Okay. That's good. Uh, so my name is Martin Tyson, and I'm the head of casework for Oscar. So uh, the teams that uh, I look after, they deal with uh, registration of, of new charities. Uh, they deal with uh, charities making changes uh, to themselves. And I also look after the team that deals with our inquiries uh, where, things, uh, where there's problems or issues uh, within charities. So that's where I come from. So what I'm wanting to talk about uh, today are the things that make for a strong charity, uh, the things that make for a charity that's run in the most resilient way possible. Now, just thinking about what resilience means, it, it's one of these words that gets used uh, quite a lot nowadays. It's a charity that can cope with change, uh, a charity that can deal with trouble if and when it comes, because things do happen, things don't always run smoothly, and the more complex, the more challenging the area that you're working in, the more likely it is that you're going to have to deal with things, deal with difficult things. Is your charity in a state, does it have the structures where it can deal with those things? And is your charity in a state where when bad things happen, it can bounce back? That's the, the, the essence of resilience. So I want to talk about some of the things that make for resilience, that, that make for a strong charity. So one of the things I want to talk about is where trustees are aware of their duties. Legally, what do you need to do? What, what help does the law give you in making the tough decisions? Or even the not tough decisions? Um, a resilient charity applies good governance. Well, that's a reasonably easy thing to say. Uh, what does it mean? Well, there's been some really good work done in the sector 
uh, over the past wee while that talks about what good governance means, and I'm going to take you through a bit of that. It looks after its beneficiaries, and it looks after its staff. It behaves appropriately to them, it looks after them, it uh, knows, it, it works for what's in their, their best interests. And it's aware of the external factors that influence its work. What are the things happening outside that might adversely affect it, that might positively affect it, and it plans to deal with those. So I want to talk about uh, aspects of all those things uh, just this afternoon. So, trustee duties. This is the stuff that's in the uh, Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005. Um, that all sounds very official, very legalese, but at the heart of it, it's a very simple idea. Um, as a trustee, you've got to act in the best interests of the charity. And that is the fundamental test that we want to be sure that you're applying, that you need to apply when you've got a decision to make. Is this in the best interest of the charity or is it not? Now, the Act's quite helpful in unpacking a little bit what that means. So, oops, that was a bad thing to do. Okay, what's an act in the best interest of the charity? It means you need to act in furtherance of the charity's purposes. What was it set up for? Here's what it's set up for. The stuff that you do needs to further that purpose. That's what it's for. Uh, and if you're doing activity, if you're spending money that isn't in furtherance of that purpose, why? You need to be asking yourself that all the time. You need to act with care and diligence. You need to take advice. You know, we were talking about that just now, uh, where you need to, and follow that advice where it's appropriate. You need to make sure that you have all the information that you need to take a, uh, to take a decision. Uh, and you need to show that you've considered options and thought through the decisions that you're making properly. And you need to manage any conflict of interest between your interests and the interests of the charity, or the interests of someone who's appointed you to the charity and the interests of the charity where the, there's a conflict there. So those are the key things that explain what it is to act in the best interests of the charity. There's some other duties there that are specific things that the, the 2005 Act says that you need to do as a charity trustee or that a charity has to do. Most of those are to do with transparency. It's all the, 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 uh, that, that, that agenda that uh, Maureen's talking about of helping people to have trust in charities, telling people what you're doing, telling people about the charity, making clear what it's for, what it's about, and what it's doing. So you need to update your details on the Scottish Charity Register, make sure they're up to date. If things change, make sure the register changes. Uh, you need to report to OSCA or ask our consent when you're making changes to your charity. You need to uh, submit uh, accounts and annual return to OSCA. You need to make sure that you comply with the fundraising uh, regulations and legislation. And you need to provide information to the public about your charitable status. If you're a SKEO, you need to tell the public that you're a SKEO. So those are the duties. Moving on from that into, you know, what is that, what is it to run a charity? What is it to run a charity well? And that's about good governance. And uh, recently there's been published uh, a Scottish governance code for the third sector. This is something that has been produced within the sector. We were involved in that, but it's been you know, produced by people within the sector. And what it does, thinking about what Maureen had to say about the structure of the, the sector in Scotland, about the size of, of charities within the sector, it doesn't set out very sort of detailed rules uh, you know, or how to do things. What it does is set out the, the core principles and the key elements of uh, good governance for charities in Scotland uh, and then it's a, you know, what that uh, lets you do is apply those to the needs and the activities of the, 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 the size of charity and the type of charity that you have. So let's look a little bit closer at those. There's five core principles. Organisational purpose, 
leadership, board behavior, control, and effectiveness. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, all of those and uh, you know, without you know, going too much into detail or uh, telling too many uh, war stories, talk a little bit about that in, in terms of the perspective that we have uh, from our casework and, and you know, our, our knowledge of, of uh, how things can go in charities. So, organisational purpose. A charity's purpose is what the charity's been set up to achieve, and that's the reason the charity ex exists. And as we talked, you know, this is something that has a very direct link into the, the uh, duties under the law. Uh, a charity trustees have to make sure the charity acts in furtherance of its purpose. Now, that seems kind of obvious, but it doesn't always work out like that. It's sometimes difficult. Um, and one of the key things is to understand the purpose. And it's, it's interesting thinking about uh, the perspective of you know, the, the, the folks in my team on that. One end of the team, they're dealing with charities that are just starting. They're dealing with charities that are registering. And they have a reasonable, you know, they, they, they've just thought about their purposes, hopefully. They, sometimes we're having a, a bit of dialogue with them about those purposes, whether they're charitable, whether they're understandable or not. So they're reasonably fresh in people's minds. Looking a bit further on, when we're dealing with charities where there are, are issues, where, where things have been raised with us, uh, sometimes people are a bit less familiar with their purposes. It becomes a bit less immediate in, in people's minds. So there is that requirement to stay familiar with your purpose, to understand your purpose, and think about whether it's still appropriate. Work to your government governing document. Um, that again sounds obvious. In practice, it isn't always. Go there is a tendency for charities, as they get through their life, to put the constitution in a drawer and sometimes not to look at it for long periods of time. Um, we will deal with a fair few phone calls and emails every year where we have charities saying, can you give us a copy of our constitution? We don't have one. Um, that does happen. Uh, I'm sure it's not happened to anyone here. Um, but it is vital to keep familiar as a charity trustee with your governing document. If it's not right, if it doesn't do the job for you, if it's getting in the way, then think about reviewing it, think about changing it. But you need to make your decisions, the key thing, make your decisions in line with the purpose that's in that governing document. You need to use your resources to meet the aims. And once you've done that, Tell people about it. Again, that point about transparency. You need to blow your own trumpet. You need to say, what is it we've done to achieve our purposes? What is it we've done with our money? What is it we've done with our resources? Uh, that's where the annual report comes in, uh, your website, uh, talking to people, the way that you communicate with, with people outside the charity, really important. Leadership. So a well-run board, it's clear about its roles and responsibilities provide strategic direction in line with the purpose, but in line with the visions and the values. And that's an interesting one, how to lead an organization. I think one of the things is you've got to be the organization's values. If you are a charity that's been set up to, I don't know, combat bullying in schools or in workplaces, and there's bullying going on in your charity, that's not gonna work very well. Um, and that does happen. I think the other, the, 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 there are examples of that. You need to you know, have a, a, a culture within the organization that embeds its vision and its, its values. You need to understand the rules and responsibilities of the board. And some of that will depend on how big the organization is and what it does. Again, looking back at the, uh, the, the profile of the sector that, that, that Maureen showed there, got a lot of small charities where there won't be employees, there may be some volunteers, uh, but sometimes the, 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 the trustees will be all there is. So they will be quite close to the activities of the charity. As things move up the scale in, in terms of size and, and, and income, uh, it becomes more complex. And the relationship of the charity trustees to staff, to volunteers and to the activities of the charity, that becomes a little bit more complex. So 
you need to think about it in terms of the size of charity you have. What's it appropriate for the board to be involved in? The question you should be asking yourself is, uh, you know, as a charity trustee, is what do I need to be involved in? What should I know? Uh, what decisions should I be making? What should we be leaving to other people and delegating? One key thing, promote equality and diversity. Uh, make sure that people are treated fairly, that uh, you're keeping to the law on equality and diversity and uh, thinking about the charity's uh, reputation, its values and its culture and, and how far equality and, and diversity are reflected in those. You then scrutinise information on activities and achievements and we'll talk a little bit about that more about that later. Um, but it's about thinking about what the role of the, the, the charity trustees in given the size of your organisation, what do you need to know? Are you getting to know what you need to know? And again, that point about delegating tasks when it's appropriate. What do you need to do as charity trustees? And what's it better for volunteers to do and for staff to do? How far do you need to be involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the charity? How far is your job uh, a more strategic one? Uh, and that will depend on the, uh, the nature of the, the activities and on the size of the charity. But the strategic piece will always be there for charity trustees. You're always there to make the big decisions. Uh, how much you're involved in the day to day will depend on the, the, the scale of the charity. Board behaviour. And in terms of um, what we see when we're looking at charities uh, in inquiries and investigations, this can be the really key one. How people treat each other. Um, a well-run board, um, collectively and individually, is one where people show uh, mutual respect, where there's integrity, where there's openness, and where there's, there's a degree of challenge. So you need to make sure that behaviour is consistent with your vision and values. That's that point that I made before. You need to be transparent, open and accountable. So that's transparent, open and accountable to the public, to your beneficiaries, to the people that fund you, but also to each other. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's surprising um, where the Chinese walls can be among charity trustees and within charities. Uh, you need to be open and accountable to each other and with each other. You need to listen to each other, you need to li listen to your beneficiaries, li listen to your staff. What that means will depend on what you do and, and on the scale of your charity, you know, uh, what that can involve. Handle concerns and complaints correctly. The more activity you do, the more things are likely to go wrong. That happens. The question is how you deal with it. And again, a lot of the business that we get will be stuff that's not particularly for us to deal with. It will be service level complaints about, from charity users about charities. That's not primarily for us to deal with and, and we're probably less likely to get involved in that. That's primarily for charity trustees to think about whether they deal with that themselves or if the, the scale of the charity demands it, how, that's, how those complaints are escalated. But it's in the interests of the charity to deal with complaints and, and comments appropriately take those on board to make sure they are dealt with and heard. Acknowledging where conflicts of interest may uh, arise. Um, and part of that is, is recognising conflicts uh, and then dealing with them. But you know, the, the, the big issue sometimes is people not realising that they have a conflict, that the other organisation that they're, in, they're involved with the decision that they're making also involves that other organisation and thinking through where that puts them and what they should be doing about that. And I think this is, in a way, it's the most diffuse one, but it's the most important one. Creating a board environment where diverse views are welcomed, um, where you need a board environment where there isn't one kingpin who, what they say goes, where other people get to challenge, where everyone on the board... Uh, gets to express their view. Um, I think the, the question to ask is yourself there is, you know, when you come out of a, of a charity trustee meeting, 
Did I get to say what I needed to say? Did all the people at that meeting get to say what they needed to say? If the answer to those questions is no, then you need to think about it again. Again, a well-run board will develop and appro implement appropriate controls to direct and oversee progress and performance of the organisation. That can be very simple in a, a small organisation, in a big uh, organisation, that can be uh, quite complex and that will be most of your time. Uh, but it's making sure that you get the appropriate information and that you scrutinise it properly. So putting in place the structures, the controls and the processes, regularly reviewing your policy and your procedures, well, you know, your, your safeguarding procedures, your recruitment procedures, all those kind of things. Are they things that are living documents? Are they things that sat in a drawer for six years and you've never looked at? Do you put them in place? Making sure your decisions are well informed. What's the basis that you're deciding things on? Do you have the figures? Do you have the numbers? Do you have the information? If not, how are you deciding? Applying appropriate risk management systems. Now, uh, risk is a scary word. It's also something that people sometimes tell you is, is, is very complex. It's basically, what are the uncertainties that might stop your charity doing the things that it needs to do in furtherance of its purposes? What are the outside things that might stop it? What are the internal things that might go wrong and might stop you doing the things that you want to do and you need to do? How, can you foresee those? Can you put things in place that will reduce those risks or uh, mitigate the effects if, they, if those things come to pass? Sometimes that can be very simple. Uh, sometimes that will involve a lot of complexity and some risks you won't be able to entirely get rid of. Uh, but have you thought about it? Evaluating performance against plans and budgets. So you decide to do something that, uh, you decided to do something last year. Did it happen? If it didn't happen, what was the reason for that? How do you do it better next year? It's you know, the, the stuff you'd expect it to do. But I think it's remarkable how often people uh, just go on from year to year without necessarily reviewing things, without thinking about things afresh. And considering whether the legal structure that you've got still works for you, if your charity's grown, if things have changed, if things have moved on, is the, the, the way that you're set up still the right structure for you? And effectiveness. And this is bringing all that together, really. So a well-run board understands its role, understands its powers, and it works collectively and proactively to achieve its organisational purpose. I think one of the, 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 the things there is to think about your board, to think about yourself as a charity trustee. Um, am I still where I need to be? Am I still in the right place? Have I still got something to contribute here? and thinking about the board as a whole. Given where we are now, given what we're doing now, do we have the right people on board? Do we have the right skills? And sometimes those are very difficult conversations to have. Those are very difficult thoughts to have. But particularly uh, as things get more challenging, uh, as things change, as things move on from when he set the charity up, are things still right? Do we still have the right people on board? If you have the right people, but people need a bit of development, how do you develop that capability? How do you move on with your skills? Are there particular things that you need to have on the board and what can you do about those? <coughs> Thinking about what happens when people retire, move on. Do you know what will happen next? That might be one of your key risks. If you do get fresh people on board, how do you bring them in? How do you get them used to the organisation? How do you let them know what their duties are and, and how to you know, go about their, their, their business. And I think one of the key things here, making sure your meetings have active participation from all. And it comes back to that word collectively that was at the top of the, 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 that, that, that section there. Um, is everyone involved? Are there people who don't turn up to meetings? Are there people who never say anything at meetings? Um, if so, why is that? 
Is it because they don't have anything to contribute? Is it because everything's okay? Uh, is it because they feel frightened or reluctant to contribute? Um, is everyone collectively managing the charity? And I think that, that, that issue of, of collective participation, of everyone being involved in the governance of a charity, I think that's a key thing about the culture in a charity, and I think particularly the culture around the charity trustee table. So, we've got copies of the, uh, good, the governance code there. Uh, I would say grab one on the way out. It's a really useful resource. We use it a lot. We recommend it to people. Uh, and hopefully it's helpful for you in your charity. Okay, think about knowing about your, your, your duties. I think knowing about some of the, the, the risks. Just a couple of things to, to highlight to you. Uh, safeguarding. This is something that uh, came up, uh, particularly during last year in the sector, uh, and uh, it's something that we've produced guidance on. Safeguarding is the action that an organisation takes to promote the welfare of children and vulnerable adults to protect them from harm. I think that one of the key things there that you can do as a charity is to think about what your involvement is in that, to think about what that particular uh, issue means for your charity. There may be no implications for your charity depending on what it does. Or there, you know, it may be very central to what your charity does or there may be implications that you haven't realised because it, it's, at the, it's only in parts of what your charity does. But it is very much worth thinking about that. There are other issues around that. There are all the issues around having a safe and secure workplace, about organisational culture, how you treat your people, how you treat your volunteers, and how you treat your employees and all those employ employment law issues. It's about culture. We have published some uh, top tips for safeguarding and I'll go through these. One is to know your charity law duties, acting in the interest of the charity. To know your other statutory duties, those will depend on the charity, it will depend on what you do, but you need to know those. Be trained in safeguarding. Know what your duties are, to know what happens, what you do, and what safeguarding is, because there's a surprising amount of uh, uncertainty about that. Manage the risks for your charity. What does it do? What risks are there in what you do to children or to vulnerable adults? Who do you work with? What sort of stuff do you do? If that's something that does apply, have appropriate policies and procedures. Properly implement those policies and procedures. And appropriate means right for the kind of thing that you do and the scale of what you do. Embed safeguarding in culture. Have clear policies around raising concerns, and that comes back to that, that uh, thing about dealing appropriately with complaints and, and, and comments and concerns. Deal with any concerns correctly. And part of that, you know, these are difficult things to deal with. If this comes up, it is difficult stuff. The most difficult thing is if you don't know where to start. If, if it happens and you haven't got a structure in place, if it happens and your people don't know what they're supposed to do, that's when it's most difficult. You can help with that by having clear policies and a clear way of behaving for people. And learn and reflect from incidents if they happen. So, external factors, things you might want to think about. Well, probably ought to think about. Uh, Brexit. We're all thinking a lot about Brexit. What does it mean for your charity? It is possible it might mean nothing, depending on what it does. Uh, but there are some real things that you ought to be thinking about. Funding. What are your funding streams at the moment? Do any of them come from Europe, whether that's directly or whether it's indirectly through uh, Scottish Government or through local authorities? What does it mean for the labour market? Think about your employees. Uh, do you have employees who are EU nationals? Do they have settled status? What happens to them on uh, 31st October, depending on where we go. Uh, specific sectoral impacts, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the impact on the healthcare sector uh, in terms of availability of drugs uh, and, and all sorts of, of factors there. How does that bear on your charity? Human rights, there will be changes in terms of, of human rights law. There will also be may well be changes in terms of data law. 
uh, and that depends on, on what happens. It's worth thinking about those things. There is guidance on our website. Sorry, I'll go back and let you actually see that. Guidance on our website, there's a whole lot of links there to uh, guidance that Scottish Government and all the other organisations have put out. Have a look at it. Um, none of us know where this is going to go, but the more you think about it, the better you'll be prepared for whatever the exit, the, the, the whatever, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever actually happens. <laughs> Other external factors, fraud and cybercrime. Uh, this is uh, fraud, when, that's when trickery is used to gain a dishonest advan advantage, often financial over another person. Cybercrime is any criminal act committed by digital means. And thinking back to the, uh, the slide that Maureen had there about notifiable events, the things that charities tell us about, 24% uh, of those are essentially your know, financial uh, issues and, and your reporting uh, you know, financial misdeeds. Um, it happens. It happens in all sectors. It happens in the, 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 the charity sector just as much as anywhere else. Um, it's reported to us and uh, that's one of the, the, the key things that we want to be reported to us in terms of the notifiable events regime. But anyone can be a target. Your charity can be a target. So it's worth thinking about to, uh, being aware of what you need to watch out for, particularly in terms of cybercrime, uh, fake emails, SMS messages, bogus links in emails, uh, ransomware, where uh, someone puts something into your systems and then asks for money to take it off, viruses, data security breaches. Um, it does happen. The sector is vulnerable to that, so make sure you're aware of it. And there's guidance on our website, both on cybercrime and on fraud and on reducing the risks of fraud in your charity. So, really, following from that, uh, the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. Think about this stuff. Uh, you can't foresee everything. Bad things do happen. We understand that. That's why we have the, the, the notifiable events regime. Uh, the effect of those things will be mitigated if you've thought about it beforehand. Uh, and I'm very happy to take some questions. Um, we're just going to do a little bit of chatting about uh, charity trustee recruitment and succession planning. And the reason why this is in the, in, the, in the agenda for today is that it's something that we come across a lot when we're out and about. Um, it's a concern because, of course, trustees are are the people who are in management and control of our charities, They're the people who are so important to charities contributing to Scottish life. Um, and we're seeing increasingly a, a, an age profile of trustees that's going up and up and up. Um, we're seeing trustees and boards that are worried about recruiting trustees. And we're seeing people who are worried about, you know, how we're going to build trusteeship to, uh, as we go forward to the future. So I think we, it's a very important topic. We want to embrace it, chat about it, and think about what our role is in trying to make this slightly better uh, and so that's why you guys are going to have to do a little bit of work today so before we start i just wondered how many people here are trustees yeah oh fantastic very big balance of trustees how many are trustees of more than one charity how many cha uh, trustees are trustees of more than two charities any more than that oh yes <laughs> So, so that's what you find. You find a lot of people are, are a trustee of one charity. Many people, once you get them to be trustees, will be trustee of more than one charity. That would include myself. Um, and that would be a very common thing. Um, and so we are very reliant on quite a small number of people. We, we estimate uh, we've got about 100, between 150 and 180,000 charity trustees um, in Scotland. Um, and that's a very rough figure because, as we talked about earlier, we don't have a trustee database, so it's not an accurate figure. But that's a lot of people doing a lot of work. So the title of, this, of the presentation was Looking for Heroes. And interestingly, when I very first did this talk, I got a bit of kickback on that. When we talk about trustees internally, we do have a slightly, it's sort of like, it's very, there's a bit of a glow about a charity trustee. They're doing something 
exceptional. They're giving their time freely. They're giving their time voluntarily for these organisations that are a massive part of Scottish life. They're a massive part of the fabric of Scottish society, and they're contributing to many of the areas that we need. Uh, we need much action. And we need a lot of support. So we see them quite heroic figures. But somebody said to me, well, that's not very fair. We're very professional. We're not just heroes, you know. We don't just put on a pair of tights and a pair of underpants and fly around. We're actually very professional. So the question is, and, and, and the answer to that is absolutely, there's a lot of, a lot of skills sitting around board tables um, in charities in Scotland, and that needs to be recognised. And I think finally the thing that we, we recognise, but it's not always recognised throughout the country, is that voluntary aspect to the role and what that means in terms of what we're asking charity trustees to do. So we need to be mindful of that and we need to be mindful that if we want to bring more people in, we need to be conscious of the fact that that's a particularly, uh, we're asking people for quite a lot um, in terms of their role. I just wanted to share a few numbers for a piece of research that Getting On Board, it's a good website um, uh, if you want to visit it. They did a bit of research a couple of years ago on uh, charity trustee recruitment and some interesting figures there. You've got 74% of charity trustees saying that they find it difficult to recruit charity trustees. You probably don't find that figure surprisingly, or you might do. We'll, we'll have a chat about that later on. 59% say their boards are not representative of the communities they serve. So is that, is, is that a problem? Is that something we should be worried about? Probably, because you should be having boards that increasingly reflect the people that you are working with. 55% said their board members were personally connected. Now, while that's not a problem in itself, some of the issues that we see coming through are when you've got a very small number of trustees that are very personally connected, married, brothers and sisters, fathers and daughters. So if you've only got that makeup of a board, that can be quite a tricky thing. 90% of charities um, recruit through word of mouth. Now again, there's a very big role for word of mouth, but 90%, that's a massive number of charities that are only using that, that way of recruiting charity trustees. And we know what happens when we use word of mouth. We tend to get people who look like ourselves or think like ourselves, and when we were not bringing that challenge into the boardroom that we need. Um, I, I won't go through them all. 55% don't use any kind of skills audit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, so do you really understand what skills it is you're looking for on your board so that you can actually fulfil that collective responsibility? 30% don't offer any induction, um, and 50% of, of charities are saying that they don't really feel equipped to do the, to do the role that they, they, they should be doing in terms of knowing what their duties are and being able to fulfil their, their duties as charity trustees or as a charity trustee board. So there's just some figures that I think are quite interesting and talk a little bit about the problem. They are quite heavily based in England and Wales. It was a UK-wide survey, but I would say it's slightly, um, it's slightly geared towards larger charities. But I don't think that's not reflective of what we see in Scotland. We did a wee survey a couple of years ago. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but one of the things I think is quite interesting is that 33% of charities that responded to our survey said that they recruit trust charity trustees every year. And that's a pretty big job if you're having to do it every year, year upon year upon year upon year. Um, and then there's some other figures there that you'll, you'll have these slides in your pack. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a few of these slides. And it's really about just thinking about the things you need to think about. And a lot of them have come up already in the conversations. So the first thing, obviously, is you need to know what your governing document says. And sometimes it can be restrictive in terms of what you can and cannot do. And you have to consider that as you recruit your trustees. And you may need to think about your own governing document and how, how that might need to evolve and change as you are changing as an organisation if you want to recruit differently. But certainly, that's the starting point. Does it tell you who you need to have on your board? Do you have to co-op members? What, what does it say about your recruitment process? The skills audit, so that's come up, and I think when you hear the word skills audit, I think when you hear the word audit, it just makes you, you know, goose pimples come up and make you feel a bit nervous. Oh dear, what have I done wrong? But I think the whole thing about a skills audit is I think it does vary from a very big organisation where it's a very complex piece of work to perhaps a smaller organisation where it's just a case of having the proper conversation. If you're about to start on a new piece of work, for instance, you're start, going to start doing more outreach work or you're going to start doing more marketing work or something for your organisation, it might be the time to think about the skills you need on your board to make that happen, to help that happen. 
So a skills audit doesn't necessarily need to be something complicated, but it is something that's important to think about so that you can actually be uh, directed a bit in terms of how you recruit your trustees and the conversations you have with your trustees and the type of training you offer your trustees as well. So that skills audit piece is quite important. And I think for a lot of small charities, they think it's for bigger charities. They think it's something for these larger charities, but actually it's probably something for everybody. You know, have we got the right skills around the board? What should we be looking for? Maybe where could we look for that? Are there professional organisations out there that are encouraging their staff to get involved in, in, in charity trustee boards? Let's make the most of that. And then the next step, of course, is you've got to attract and advertise. And this is where I think things are getting easier, things are getting better, because we're no longer in the situation that you either do it by word of mouth or you take out an expensive newspaper article or you put something on a notice board in some building. What we're, what, what, we're in the state that you can, you can reach hundreds and thousands of people if you have the right channels. Um, you, you, the Maggie's example was quite interesting. There's other places that you might be able to have a partnership where you can get an advert out there. There are also people who are dedicated now and have often quite free, um, resource, free slots for advertising for charity trustees or cheap <coughs> slots for advertising for charity trustees. So uh, is there one that's the right one for you? Will you reach the right people through that? And, and are you just using your own social media if you have it or somebody else's social media who you are in partnership with? So in a sense, the whole social media, website world does make this bit slightly easier. You might be able to reach a wider audience. And sometimes we individually don't have the skills to make the most of that, but you might have somebody who can help you with that. Uh, you might co-opt somebody in for the summer to help you uh, with your overall uh, social media offering or whatever, and to help you think through a bit how you advertise your trustee positions. And then, of course, once you've advertised, you get 100 people beating down the door to say, I would love to be your charity trustee. Um, and so then you have to do your selection and your, and your interviewing uh, process. But, but seriously, hopefully you'll have more than one. If you do, you need to be having a conversation with these people and, and being, I think, that message that came through loud and clear just now, transparent, clear, busting about the myths, uh, letting them know what support they'll have, making sure you're having that conversation and trying to get the right person, both in terms of skills, but also in terms of the right person that will fit around your board table. So that conversation is quite important. But even if you've only got one person, it is worth having that conversation so that at the very beginning, you do have that transparency, you do have that clarity, and people know what it is they're letting themselves in for. In a positive way, not in a negative way. They just, there's just a bit of a clarity around that process. And then you need to do whatever you need to do to get that person on board and your governing document will have some rules around that so just make sure that that's followed most people in this room no doubt do that properly there are occasions where it doesn't happen properly you know we probably won't hear about most of them but just make sure you're following your rules and this part for me is one of the most important i am now a trustee with Accorda foundation um, and their induction process was pretty brilliant of course i always i'm slightly cynical thinking oh well they knew i worked for oscar so they polished it all up and got it perfect by the time i started but it was very good because what it did was before i even started i had some good information i was allowed to meet some staff i was allowed to get the right policies i was allowed to have the right chats and when i first went to my first board meeting i was able to even have a conversation to to, to be a participant in that discussion and that's what you want. You want a board member to be able to come along and feel that they've got something to offer, even if it's only a tiny little thing in that first board meeting. So do you have an induction process? And again, it doesn't have to be anything complicated, but you just have to make sure they know what your purposes are, they know what your vision is, where are you trying to take the organisation, what is their role in that, uh, what, what time dedication do they need to put aside for, for the work, um, give them copies of your latest annual accounts so that they can understand the work. So just some kind of basic package that they can understand. And again, I think it, Sally talked a bit about that whole, there's a bit of a process that goes on. You've got induction, but as you go along, there should be a training, possibly a training offer for, for trustees as they get more and more skilled in their roles. So think about that, but certainly think about the induction process because it's so very important as you go along. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch on young trustees because I have no massive solution for you here. But I do think it's something that's beginning to be talked about more and more. If we want to start encouraging young people to come in, if we want it to see it as a, as a volunteering option and not just, you know, not just 
a volunteering option doesn't have to be to go paint walls somewhere or to dig ditches or whatever it is. It can be something that is a, a governance role, which some people do actually really like. So can we reach these people? Can we get them in? And how do we do it? If you're trying to attract young people, you do have to probably possibly do something different if you haven't got young people in before. You might need to consider the way you're advertising. You might need to think a bit about a mentoring programme before you came in. I was liking that example. If you get somebody in for a summer, maybe they come in for two summers, and then maybe bit by bit you discover they've got skills of, they might have the skills to be on the board, and you can mentor them into that role. So are there different ways of approaching attracting young people to your organisation so that they may become the trustees of the future for your organisation? And as I say, I think bit by bit, there are quite interesting trustee programmes. I didn't actually ask our five voluntary action people before we started, but sometimes in local areas, there are programmes going on that are trying to encourage younger people to get involved in trusteeship. Um, I've just put a couple of things up that might be interesting um, for people to, to look at. International Voluntary Service have, got, have had a young trustee programme trying to encourage younger people to get trained up and to get into, uh, to get into trustee roles. Um, Napier has a sort of an academic programme, but again, that's working with young people to get them ready for, for, for board <coughs> positions. Getting on board is a great resource that is now trying to, to work on this young trustee programme. So I think bit by bit there are efforts going on to think about how do you get people in. And I think what we mustn't do is make assumptions about that. We've got a very good blog on our website by Cordelia Sampson. Is that her? Cordelia Sampson, who did a blog for us on being a young trustee. And what she raised a bit was there was quite a lot of myths around young people and trusteeship. She faced quite a lot of obstacles and she was a bit of a governance geek. She absolutely loved it. You know, she was already a trustee on a couple of boards and she was doing a great job. But when she started off, people were assuming she wasn't interested. Oh, do you want a volunteer position? Over? Oh, you won't want to do this. A lot of assumptions about what young people people want and instead we should open up those gates explain what it is that we need explain what it is that we want and find that pathway and I think there was quite a good few comments out there about how you get that pathway for people being interested in your work to getting them to come be interested in the governance of your work because if you get the governance of your work right then it's much more likely that your your work is going to have impact in the medium to long term you can go along with bad governance for a short while but if you don't get your governance right then ultimately you <coughs> You're, you're on a sugary peg. And that's all I'm going to say because we, are, we have definitely run out of time and I know it doesn't answer any of your questions but what we are going to do is do some more thinking about how we can work with our partners across Scotland on this area of work. I'm going to pass back to our chair now.